Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cruising Back from Mackinac Seminar presented by Great Girls, hosted by Crowley's Yacht Yards at Yachtapalooza 2021. Uh, my name is Mike Folan, and I'll be moderating this uh, seminar. Uh, today, Greg will be, uh, uh, will join Greg as he sells from Michael Island to Monroe Harbor. We'll talk about making a cruising plan, shares don't leave um, home without a checklist, explore some favorite places to stop, and experience, discuss weather tips, time management, and more. Uh, let's sail along with him on this adventure. Let me start with a little housekeeping, though. Um, all of today's seminars will be presented before a live audience and broadcast live via Zoom as a webinar. For those attending live, please wear your masks and maintain a safe social distance, as I see you are. Thank you. We will be recording all of the seminars today and we'll post them on the Crowley's Yacht Yard YouTube channel later this week. Um, please hold your questions till the end. Those attending online can type their questions into the Q&A feature and we'll address them when the presentation is done. Um, and for the sake of those attending, I will repeat all questions. Um, let me introduce Greg. Uh, Greg is a retired science teacher and guest stars as an employee at Crowley's. He is a member of the Great Lakes Single Handed Society and season Mac Racer with 18 Macs on his own. He'll be completing, competing in this year's Mac celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations! Thank you. Uh, in his classic 50 year old Pearson 33 Margar Margarita Bill. Class goes back with his bride, Annie. Uh, now let me turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Michael. First time for me for one of these. Welcome to Yadapalooza, as chilly as it is. It's, uh, it's good to be here. My name is Greg, and um, I would uh, like, I hope that within the next 45 minutes that you come away with something that you think is valuable that is make your time here um, well spent. Um, so, my seminar is called Back from the Mat which is a little unusual because it's what I like to refer to as a reverse cruise. Most of us start at a home port and we go to some destination and back. And in this case, you start at a destination and then you go back home. Um, as such, what I would like to do is, well, and also I should remind that this is not a travelogue. This is not a, here's all these places and these beautiful scenes and like that. This is very much a, a how-to particularly for either the beginning cruiser or a cruiser who's decided that you want to kind of stretch out a little bit, you want to travel further, you want to travel longer, um, you want to try some different ports. And in particular with a reverse cruise, there's some things to keep in mind that you generally aren't confronted with. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to start actually by sharing with you my first cruise, Annie and my first cruise, and my lovely bride, by the way, is handing out baskets uh, to the ship's store. If you happen to see that young lady, that's my lovely wife. So it was uh, 1988. My wife and I had bought a 1975 Pearson 22. We bought it in midsummer of 70s, uh, 87. And already we were filled with enthusiasm about sailing, and in particular, crossing the lake. So, my little handy dandy pointer, we had decided that what we would do is for our first cruise, we would start here in our home port in Chicago, and we would go over to Michigan City, Indiana. So that's, of course, like that. Now, there's a few things you should know about that trip. First of all, neither of us had ever sailed before. We knew absolutely nothing about sailboats. So that winter, I read a lot. My wife read a lot too, mostly historic fiction and adventure novels. But needless to say, we were excited about taking this trip. Now our boat, all four windows leaked. We had no electronics. We did have a compass one of those little bitty gimbal compasses that have a hook on them that you can put to a clip on the bulkhead. That was our compass. And we had a British Seagull outboard motor, that motor. We um, did 
didn't know, we were so naive that we didn't know when we bought the boat that that motor was stuck in forward. We thought that's the way it was built. So whenever you pull the cord, the flywheel starts, the motor kicks off, you go. Nonetheless, we were excited. We thought, we're heading for an adventure. We had a lot of enthusiasm. So I did have one question, though. I had one question I wasn't sure of, and I asked two different people who sailed, same question, different times. And it was this. If I'm crossing the lake, or here, we'll get the bigger picture here. I'm out here somewhere, and I'm not in sight of land. How do I know where I am? Well, both of them said, you use Loran. <laughs> now, I didn't know what Loran was. I knew I didn't have it. So I said, well, what do you do if you don't have Loran? I am not kidding. Both of them said to me, then you don't know. Now, ironically, even in 1988, you have people who are already completely electronic dependent. They didn't know how to chart, they didn't know how to plot, they knew nothing about data reckoning. They relied on their Lorraine. Regardless, we took off. Oh, oh, I know what, <laughs> not just regardless, I knew one thing. I knew that if I faced the bow of my boat and I looked off my right shoulder, if I could keep the Indiana shoreline in view, I'd get there. So I'm ready. And off we went. It was a beautiful day, very, very little wind. Uh, we motored probably most of the time, sailed some of the time. About six hours into the flight, I thought, you know, I wonder where we are. And I spotted a fishing boat. I'm guessing now, yeah, we were probably six miles up, six miles offshore. So we maneuvered our boat over to this fishing boat, which was kind of sitting in the water. As some of you can probably anticipate what I'm going to say next, I asked for directions. And they went down, checked their Loran, and gave me a bearing. I had noticed when we came up with the boat, they had this huge antenna on the back, up to seven feet. I thought, ah, the antenna, it's Loran. We headed our course. We wound up in Michigan City, had a tremendous three days there, and then we were ready to head for home. So I said to myself, I don't want to follow the coast anymore. I want to just make that straight shot back to Chicago. Well, I learned two things about power boaters during this three days. Number one, they almost all had Loran. And number two, they're really a friendly bunch, especially around cocktail hour. So I talked to them. I said, can you give us a bearing for Chicago? Well, they did better than that. He gave me a bearing and he gave me a distance. Now, I happen to have on that boat this book. This was one of the books that I had read. And I knew that if I could calculate my speed somehow, I could figure out how far we traveled and how far we had yet to go. So that then became the dilemma. How do I do speed? Well, I had a wristwatch at that time with a second hand off. Didn't we all? No digital, right? No a second hand. And I knew my boat must be 22 feet long because it said, oh, day 22. So at the first hour, my wife went to the bow of the boat with a box of Ritz crackers. And on my signal, she dropped the Ritz cracker. And I would time how long it would take for that cracker to get past the stern of the boat. And I would have distance divided by time, miles per hour, feet per second. Well, don't try it, Ritz crackers sink. But, Carrot sticks float. So every hour, my bride would drop carrot sticks. I would time them. I would get a speed. And then after the second hour, I started averaging the speeds. 
what I didn't realize I was doing was I was doing dead reckoning. I just didn't know. We hit Chicago right on the money. From that moment on, we were hooked. We were hooked not only just with sailing, but with traveling, with going places. So let's fast forward now to 2021. And now we have a different kind of a cruise. We're looking at a much longer cruise. A cruise now where Ann and I start up in Lake Huron. And then we travel all the way back to Chicago. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a reverse cruise. So it has a whole lot of different issues and problems associated with it. So in my outline, these are five things we're going to cover here today, this morning. The first, the advanced planning part. Then transforming Margaritaville, that's our boat. Places to go, things to do. Underway, traveling port to port. And then finally, smelling the barn, which is my father's phrase for, I want to go home. First, let's look at securing reservations. Now, Annie and I raced the old doll up to Mackinac Island in the cruising division. So that's how we get the boat up there. For a little information, my bride does not sail. She rides on a sailboat, but she doesn't sail. So I have five crew members, and myself is the sixth, and we race the boat up. We start on a Friday with the cruising division, and then we get up there Monday, generally late afternoon, sometimes Monday night. When you arrive there, your Monday night reservations, your docking reservations, are paid for by your Chicago Yacht Club race fee. The awards are on Tuesday, and your Tuesday reservations are paid for by your race fee. What most people don't know is that for that weekend, the state of Michigan and the Harbor Authority and Mackinac Island turn over the running of the marina to the Chicago Yacht Club. They bring a big boat up there, they bring support staff, and the dock staff at the marina works for them for that weekend. After the award ceremony on Tuesday, when Wednesday morning comes around, the control of the harbor goes back to the state of Michigan and the Mackinac Island Harbor Authority. They have a simple, an elegant solution to dealing with all the boats that are up there from the race. They kick you out. Every boat that's there that does not have a mooring paid for from a residence, you're gone. A lot of racers will go, um, some go to Wisconsin because there's a bunch of races up in Bill County. There's, um, you know, there's the Harbor Springs we got up, uh, and a whole lot of folks just at home. But Ann and I, we want to start our vacation up there. We want to begin, and we haven't begun yet, because my bride hasn't even gotten there yet. So how do you solve that problem? Well, there are marinas in Michigan that are under very high demand, very small size. Mackinac Marina is one of them. I make my reservations for that marina six months in advance. I will make them for that Wednesday night, Friday, Saturday, um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four nights. The most you can reserve are four consecutive nights. So if you want to combine the race, if you would want to do that, two cruising like we do, you have to book that well in advance. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, what they do is they make me leave the dock but I've already talked to the harbor master. I already have my assignment. I have to leave wherever I'm docked, pull into my new dock, and I'm done. So you can come up and look at these later. Here's a picture of Margaritaville during the race. This picture is taken the next day. All the boats are gone. So under your advanced planning, securing reservations is very, very key. There's two other things, too, to keep in mind on. Now, this year, Ann and I are going to go to Beaver Island for our second half. Uh, two years ago, we went to Charlotte. But this year, we're going to go to Beaver Island. Same scenario. I had those booked six months before. 
for the race. And then our third stop is going to be Leland, little bitty harbor. Man, in the mid '80s, you could just glide in there, no problem. Now, very touristy, uh, hard to get get into, hard to get reservations. And I've already booked my reservations for Leland as well. So part of this planning is looking at those hard to get harbor reservations. <clears throat> You can talk with either the people who run the marina, like Leland, for example, is a municipal harbor, or you can look, uh, contact the state of Michigan and you can talk to their reservation service, real people online, and talk to them about harbors that are difficult to get into. Now, let's go on a little further. This section is called Festivals, Fishing, and Frivolity. Well, of course, there are other things that interfere with you getting harbor spot and i'm just going to touch on a couple more festivals every one of these little towns along the way is going to have a festival they're going to have a fourth of july festival many of them have a venetian night festival they'll have art festivals they'll have music festivals some of these are so big that they block up all the mooring space i'll just highlight the two biggest on the lake one is charlevoix Charlevoix, right there. July 17th to July 24th. Sounds kind of mackish, doesn't it, about that time? Well, in Charlevoix, for that whole week, it's Venetian Festival. If you haven't been there, Charlevoix, beautiful, beautiful place. Nice little lovely round lake. Very pricey, very expensive, very pinkies up. And it's very impossible to get dock space unless you are well in advance. Here's the second one, and that's Grand Haven. That's way down here. They have what's called Coast Guard Days. And at Coast Guard Days, big weekend festival, all the spots are filled up. My wife and I have been kicked out of there at least three different occasions where we came down in midweek, morning. Dockage, not a problem. By the time Friday rolls around, it's already filled. So there's your festivals. Now let's talk about fishing. Oh boy, like fishing, are you kidding me? Now for this guy, I have copies here for you. You can just come up, pick one, take one if you want. Lake Michigan runs fishing tournaments whole summer long. And on those tournaments, if that tournament is in that harbor, you're not gonna get a space. So let me just give you an example. Michigan City, St. Joe, South Haven, Grand Haven, Manistee, Ludington, Holland, Saugatuck, Frankfurt, Travis City. So keep that in mind. And then last but not least, frivolity. Let's say you thought, hey, you know, let's go to uh, let's go to Michigan City on the first weekend in uh, August. That sounds like fun. Well, it's fun if you like 50 foot, 4,000 horsepower, ocean going offshore racing boats. It's fun then because that's when they have their offshore contest. In addition, there's offshore races up and down the coast during the summer. And they'll book in Grand Haven, Muskegon, Holland, and Sagata. So I guess what I'm saying here, maybe in an overly lengthy manner, is when you start planning a trip like this, look at that. Look into these towns, see what events are taking place, and how they're going to impact your harbors. Now, last but not least is time. My wife and I set aside a month, four weeks. And we do that because we want to spend days in each of these harbor places. And we also want to have weather windows. My wife and I do not travel when it's blowing 20 and the seas are only six to eight feet, we don't do that. We stay in port. We only travel when the weather is nice. So I would encourage you to be reasonable about your time planning and your time management. How far are you gonna travel? How long do you wanna stay? And give yourself weather protection. The one year where we really kind of blew that, we had decided to push it and go all the way down. Um, in Buffalo, 
And uh, we got in a jam. We wound up leaving the boat in New Buffalo and hopping a train and going home. And then I took the train back the next week and single-handed the boat back to the home. So time management is very, very important. Now, transforming Margaritaville. Well, going from race to cruise. So if you decide to do what we do, which is race your boat up, cruise your boat back, one of the problems you're going to be facing with is how do you de-race it? So in this case, I've got five guys and all their gear, safety gear, harnesses, PFDs, fall weather gear, boots, sweaters, coats, everything. I've got to get that off of the boat, and I have to get all of the other sleeping gear off of the boat, and I have to put all of my cruising gear on the boat. So going from race to cruise is much simpler when you're doing it in your home port. It's much more complicated when you're doing it up there. Well, one of the ways we get around that, Annie and I get around it, is Annie drives up to the uh, island in her um, daily driver, which is a Ford F-150 glide cam. And that is, and she's 410, by the way, so she's a hoop watching her climbing out of her truck. But she will have loaded in that truck all of my cruise gear for Tuesday for the party. She will have all of our cruising gear in the truck. She will go up to Mackinac City, get a hotel room, and then ferry across here to the island. And then the crew will help switch their gear back off the island. So when Ann steps on board, then on Wednesday, the truck keys go to the crew. They drive the truck home. But that's kind of a transition that we need to go through. Now, what I've also run off is a list that you can also pick up called Greg and Ann's Race to Cruising Transition Reminders. I took this from handwritten notes of, uh, that we keep just to kind of keep track of things. And I'm just going to highlight four of them, just four. Um, there are 20 on here. Number one. Fenders of lines. We bring seven dock lines and four fenders. And if you're racing, that might not seem like things seem like you're crazy. But remember, we're in the cruising division. The reason we bring that many lines and fenders, if you've never moored at the island, the water in the harbor behaves like a safe. So when the tour boats come rolling in, the level of water in the harbor rises and then moves. So it will lift your boat and it will swing you sometimes violently back and forth and make us kind of like a rhythm. The, um, the, the state of Michigan will often give you a little warning about docking there if you've never docked there before. They'll tell you that it's to be careful docking in the harbor. So you need two bow lines. Two stern lines, one to the dock, one to a post if you're lucky. Two springers, and then we always bring an extra one because many of these ports on the way will put you so far away from a cleat that you'll have to double up on a line to get to. So seven lines, four fenders, not unusual. I always cover my fenders because these motions rub against the side of my boat. My boat's got a nice paint job on it. So... I find covers valuable. Number two, mosquito netting. Now, I would encourage you, if you take a, like, a lengthy trip like this, to not just have the screens in your hatches, but to also have a way to screen in your whole companion way, which is what this, this one does. So that way, at night, when you read, and the bugs want to invade your boat, you can have a lot of fresh air, but you can keep the bugs away. Uh, number three, harbor guides. I love harbor guides. I'll put these out so you can take a look at them if you want. This is called Lake Michigan Ports of Call. It is out of print, but I bought this one four weeks ago. So you can still find them. What do I love about it? Well, I'm visual. See, I'm a very visual kind of, you know, you can tell, visual kind of person. So for me, a book like this is perfect. It will have a color aerial photograph of every harbor. 
I like that. No matter how many times I've been someplace, I want to see where I'm going. It will also have a chart next to useless. Use your regular chart. But it will also have a lot of contact information. Everything from restaurants to go to, to the harbor, to uh, what's at the harbor. Is there gas? You can get fuel, diesel, whatever. These are great. Now, the modern equivalent of this, this is called the Waterway Guide. They have these for sale. Now I'm being a shill here for Crowley's. They have uh, these for sale at the ship store. It's the lake book, only it has all the lakes. So you get the same thing, only for every lake. Every one of the Great Lakes. They don't publish the individuals anymore. The state of Michigan used to publish a Michigan Harbor Guide. Also had photographs of the harbors. Nothing as complete as those books. Well, they don't print this anymore, but here on the table, I'm going to loop around. I'm going to go out of the camera view here for a second. I ran off a bunch of these for you. This is a cover page to the Harbor Guide. It shows you everything that's in it. Pull it up online, make copies, and you can have your own Harbor Guide. And then, last but not least, your Yacht Club card. So I'll do what everybody says. How many of you are a member of the Yacht Club? Anybody in the audience mulling it over? This is for you. This, this is for you. I have mine saying, uh, I realize this is going to be off camera here, but mine's uh, Yacht Club card, don't leave home without it. The reason I say that is because your yacht clubs are all up and down the coast. You might want to be bad again because I'm going to go get my yacht. I'm going to go get, uh, would you hand me the one with the yacht club flying on? And the guy right there. So I have a list of these for you, too. These are the yacht clubs in Michigan. Great places to stop. My wife and I really enjoy. You can, these are nice places to go dine. They're nice places if you need help, you need a recommendation. I've got motor trouble or whatever. Yacht clubs are very, very friendly, and there are lots of them up and down the lake. Second reason I like this is I'm going to sell this idea to you. So I'll say thank you. When my wife and I travel, anywhere we go that there's water, we bring our yacht club card with us. So when we visit my son in Key West, Florida, and I say, geez, where should we go to dinner? I'll go, oh, let's find the Key West Yacht Club. Or we were in San Diego for a bowl game. Where should we go hang out? Oh, let's go to the San Diego Yacht Club. Or we're in Florida. Let's go to the St. Augustine Yacht Club. So that card gives you a lot of access, not only to all of these places up and down the lake, but also vacationing too. So we're big fans. All right. Um, I guess we're places to go and things to do. Now, I'm not going to emphasize this one a lot. Well, you know, Michael, I didn't do a very good job of getting my own, my own brochures. So. And once again, these are printed out for you. But if you came thinking, boy, I hope he was going to talk about some of his favorite places, I'm going to mention a couple unusual ones. Just something I can only say, and I tell you this is all honesty, know yourself. And when you go to these new harbors, look for things that you know you're going to be interested in. Seek them out. They might not be, you know, they might not be obvious at the beginning, but find them. For example, my wife and I like books. We like little local bookstores. We like public libraries. And believe it or not, when we go and we stay in a place for several days, we will seek out the public library. I'll read the newspapers. My wife will read the book. We have internet access, love that. Um, in addition, we like museums. So especially like local historical museums, things like that. 
That's really big on our list. We like that kind of stuff. Movie theaters. We like going to shows. So like in Frankfurt, for example, there's a great little movie theater in Frankfurt. In Nashville, there's a cool little movie theater that their historical society has rebuilt. Cool movie theater in Nashville. South Haven's got a neat little movie theater. So you can find these kinds of spots. We're not big into um, like a tchotchke shopping, but we do love art. We like fine art. So art museums and uh, let's see, Ben Harbor St. Joe, they've got a beautiful art museum there. Uh, Saugatuck, Michigan, very artsy place. Um, and uh, well, the Chicago, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago had established an art um, school or colony there in 1910, I believe. Uh, so art galleries are big on our, our list of places to go to. What you'll find in this one is kind of a, Greg and Ann thinks that tickle our fancy. So here, this is every harbor that we that we visit regularly. Like we'll hit almost every one of these on, on any trip or two years. So I'm gonna give you two kind of unusual ones that may like cause you at least to scratch your head and go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. First one is gonna be Michigan, I'm sorry, it's gonna be Mackinac City. Mackinac City. So we're just traveling across Huron here, across the bay, not very far at all. And then we set up shop again for like four days. Now, we did this one uh, three years ago. We wanted to go to Sault Ste. Marie. Well, there's no reason why you can't leave your boat when you're cruising and go someplace. So the question was, how do we get a rental car? Well, I called before this to see if this still was there for for you to consider. They were closed, they were, the office was closed, so you'll have to wait to figure it out on your own. In the marina office, on their bulletin board, used to be a card that had a rental number on it. I call this number. The guy says, send me a picture of your driver's license and a picture of your insurance card. Click, that. He says, Find, you'll find a Ford Escort in the parking lot by the marina. The door is open. The keys, honest to God, the keys are above the visor. Fill it up when you return it. And that was it. And so we got in our Ford Escort. We headed up to uh, uh, the locks. We stayed at the Lockview Motel. It's just another thing about my wife and I. We love kind of old school stuff. Had a wonderful, wonderful time. Brought the car back, got back on Margaritaville, and away we went. Here's a second one. Um, Saugatuck, Douglas. A lot of people like to go to Saugatuck. Very busy, very cool place, very artsy. It's got a cool vibe. It's got a really nice, welcoming, friendly vibe. Very, very touristy, though. Um, so I would suggest that. Instead of trying to dock at Sagata, which it will put you, if you can find space, it puts you right in the middle, of the unless you like that. Annie and I always go to Tower Marine in Douglas, and uh, that's on this list too. Now, there's a couple of cool things about that. We like quiet. So you've got nice little parks there, you've got the swimming pool, but we like to go hang out in Sagata. Well, the county runs a robust service on demand. You call them and they come and pick you up and they'll take you. And uh, let's see, our senior rate is 50 cents. So it costs us a buck to get over there. One of the other cool things is they'll return you, same thing. You call them and say, I'm here, you know, come pick me up. And there's a little grocery store that's right near the marina, about a mile away. And uh, that's another thing. We love little local grocery stores. We just think that's really cool. So we do our provisioning there. And then it's about a mile walk, so we just take a little knapsack and we can walk back to the boat. So there's two for you. There's two kind of different kind of things. But sorry for Douglas, that's that's kind of me. Um, port to port. I'm gonna cut I'm gonna cut this one down here. Because it's out of the camera view. Ah. 
I think that'll work. You're going to motor or you're going to sail? A good friend of mine told me years ago, my cruising mentor flipped that half the time you're going to motor. I'm going to spot on. Half the time you're going to motor. Sometimes more than that. Now, Annie and I, we don't mind that. And you can probably see by a lot of these photographs, we have shade. That's, and we run that quite all the time. I carry three sails. I race to Mackinac with three sails. A cruising chute, a fully bat main with three reef points in it, and I can't tell you how many times I've dropped the three reefs, and a 150 gen. If you're looking at this kind of cruising or cruising racing, we go with slightly heavier fabric. The racer would say, oh, you can't do that, it's too heavy, you're going to lose speed. The cruiser says, I can deal with any kind of weather. I don't have to worry about grabbing a storm jib because I can create my own storm jib. And in one of these pictures here, well, I'll come up and look at it. I took a picture of our 150 rolled way in with a block and tackle that I put on it to make it work as a storm jib. You might look at that and say, well, I mean, it's pretty calm there. Yeah, I took the picture when it's calm. Because trust me, when I rate this, I'm not taking pictures of it. <laughs> so we run these three sales. Most of the time, we don't use our name. Most of the time, we're running under the 150 or the chute, and we keep our tent up the whole time, and we sit, and we read, and relax, and we lose maybe a knot. No, we don't care because we're cruising. So that's our kind of sailing inventory. The lake interstate and fishing fleets, you will find once you start doing this, that if you leave one harbor and you lock into the next, you go out a few miles, two, three miles, lock into your next destination and start straight lining it, you're going to find that that's what everybody does. Power boaters do it if it's a calm day. Other sail boaters do it, and so there'll be traffic. What Ann and I like to do instead is we like to hug the coast. So that means you've got to know your chart work or have a really good chart plotter and your depth finder. Because it's not unusual for us to sail on 20 feet of water, where everybody else is sailing in 60, 90, 100 feet of water. But we like being close to shore, seeing houses, looking at binoculars, watching people on the beach. Now that's for us, that's part of the whole fun of, uh, of the travel. Fishing fleets. Um, I shouldn't admonish you because you haven't done anything wrong, at least in my eyes, yet. But if there are among you somebody that says, oh, I'm a sailboat, and that fishing boat is under power, and he should give way to me. Well, Forget that. These people are earning a living. They are working. That's their job. You are not working. You are not earning your living. And so even though it can be for inconvenience to us as sailors or cruisers, I always give these people a wide berth. You know they're going to be mooring at four knots. And you know they're trailing lines. And you can kind of predict what the trajectory is. And you can kind of work your way around them. I think it's very important to respect those, those people in fishing. Well, we're almost done. The last item is smelling the barn. There will come a time when Ann and I will look at each other. It's normally about three and a half weeks in, and we'll say, let's go home. Now, for us, that happens generally two places. One, it will be right there Benton Harbor St. Joe and we really like Benton Harbor St. Joe St. Joe Yacht Club we like to dine there you can get free bicycles from the from the uh, uh, marina um, Benton Harbor is a hurting town it's been hurting for a long long time uh, but there's some renovation downtown you can even bike there there's new shops there's new restaurants people are trying and then, of course, across the river, you've got a full-blown city with museums and a gorgeous view. 
that's that's one spot where we'll say, okay, let's pilot sheet home. And the other way would be Racine if we're on the Wisconsin side. And then after Racine, it'll be let's head home. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is it. I uh, I hope you found at least something for a while. I hope you'll help yourself and take some of these items if you'd like. Uh, we have questions, I guess, if, if anybody has any. Yes. Um, thank you, Greg. Yeah, uh, does anybody have any questions? I have one comment, which is you're hugging the shore and watch out for the little thing. Oh, oh, yeah. It's really about the surface and there, you know. And sometimes you'll find where uh, markers where people have left nuts. You know, you gotta kind of keep your eye out for that, too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we're something, right, Mike? Yep. All yep. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.